We'll be continuing our uh, series in the Book of Romans this morning, and we've spent the last uh, couple of weeks in Romans chapter eight. And Brother Al has been uh, has been uh, leading us through the first seventeen verses of uh, of Romans chapter eight. Today we'll be looking at verses eighteen. Uh, through 25. But before we, we read that, I want to I wanna just ask you a question. And I'm sure I, I'm sure I know what the answer is, but I just want to stir your thoughts in this respect. Do you ever wonder why life can be so difficult? I'm sure you do. You know, sometimes we do foolish things that cause ourselves trouble, and we, we realize that. We make a bad decision um, we, might, uh, we might fall into sin and it causes some grief. And, and perhaps that's understandable. But often, we seem to be innocently trying our very best to just carry out our lives, to just exist, to, to have some happiness, whatever it might be. And we find invariably that life is just one big struggle. You ever wonder about that? Why that it's like that? It, as I was thinking about that, it made me think of uh, a movie, that, a Disney movie, that I can remember a number of years ago um, watching with our kids. Anybody remember this movie? The Lion King. And you remember the characters? The little lion is uh, the one that's destined to be uh, king of all the lions. His name was Simba. And he had um, uh, an interesting uncle whose name was Scar. And he was sort of a twisted fellow that... Uh, that in some ways uh, corrupted, tried to corrupt Simba. But as they were talking, and we see that in this picture, one of the things that uh, um, Scar said to Simba when they were discussing some of the difficulties in life, and it was, I believe it was the actor Jeremy Irons who has a lovely British accent that, uh, that did the voice of, of Scar, and he said to Simba, life's not fair. And it's not. It doesn't seem fair, does it? There are many things that happen to good people. And in general, when we are often innocently trying to get ahead and trying to just live our lives, we find that it's just one big struggle and it doesn't seem fair and it's very difficult to understand. Perhaps you have kids and you might have even had your kids even say that to you sometimes when you make a decision in your home and you believe it's a good decision and it's a right decision. And your kids might say, it's not fair. Because it seems to be such a struggle. Well, we want to look at that this morning. We want to look at uh, the human struggle, so to speak, and we want to uh, see how really it all started with Adam. And that's a key point that we'll look at this morning, is that this struggle started with Adam. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, to turn to Genesis chapter 3 before we read in uh, in Romans 8. And you can keep your finger in in Romans chapter 8 because we will get there. But I want to start in Romans chapter 3. And of course you know it's in Romans chapter, sorry, in Genesis chapter 3. And you know that it's in Genesis chapter 3 where the, sorry for confusing you. We will look at Romans 8. We'll get that straight. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. I'm seeing some giggles in the audience. If that's the biggest mistake I make this morning, then we won't be too too badly off. But if you remember in Genesis chapter 3, that this is where the fall happened, where we see that Adam and Eve fell into sin and they disobeyed God. And what I want to remind you of is what some of the consequences of that fall were. We know, of course, that when Adam and Eve sinned, that they, they had already been told, in particular Adam was told, as the one that was given dominion over creation, that in the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he would surely die. And the context teaches us that that is something that he would have passed on to the woman, to Eve, this, this one that was given to him as a helper and a mate. And we know that they both partook of that fruit and that that was how sin and death came into the world. But there were other consequences besides that. And we read about this in Genesis chapter 3, in particular in verse, um, in verse 16. We see it said to the woman, to Eve, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. And we see that not only did death come into the world at that time, but pain came into the world as well. That pain was now part of the creation and it hadn't previously been part of the the world. 
And in verse 17, he said to Adam, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return." You see, something else changed. That the plant kingdom changed when Adam sinned. That before, the ground just naturally brought forth plants and fruits and vegetables, and it was a paradise where man could basically graze through this garden that God had given him, and it just naturally yielded up uh, food for him without any struggle at all. But when Adam sinned, it plunged, plunged the creation into a new corrupted state, And we see that now mankind, Adam's race, was going to need to struggle just to to find food and to eat. And we know that too. Any of us that have gardens know that you just don't plant the seeds and just walk away from it and then just show up and start eating the food, right? Weeds show up and insects show up and, and, and it's just like there's something there that's working against that food to keep it from us. It's been corrupted. That came about as a result of Adam's sin as well. You see, the paradise that God had put Adam and Eve in was lost when Adam sinned. And I have on the screen here a number of things which entered into the picture, which came into the creation when it was corrupted by sin. You see, before Adam sinned, there was no sorrow and there was no no tears, but there there is now. And that came about as a result of Adam's sin. There was no such thing as really hard work before Adam sinned. But we know now that the creation is characterized by toil and sweat. We try to get away from that. And one of the things I was thinking about as as I was preparing for this is how, when I was a a young boy, how the great hope of our society was that as we learned to advance computer technology and use technology, such as computers, how we'd become like little gods and, and, and life would become easy because the computers would do so much for us. Well, some of us that have computers in our jobs know that in fact... In some ways, it's made it much, much difficult, much more difficult, that there's still toil and sweat, even although we all, most of us, or many of us, have uh, a computer that sits on our desk and is hooked up to everybody else's computer through the internet or a, a local area network or whatever it might be. And we know that the creation is now characterized by suffering and pain. And we see how that pain was even pronounced on the woman as a result of the sin that had come into the world and is not just limited to women as well. We see suffering and pain in general in this, in this creation. Disease and illness, things that lead to death, those things didn't exist before Adam sinned, but they sure do now. And of course, aging and death itself. You see, Adam's sin plunged the whole creation into a corrupted state, which has resulted in the struggle to survive that each of us are part of today. <clears throat> and you know, this corrupted state is not something that has just come on Adam's race, the fact that we get sick and we experience suffering and pain and uh, we age and we ultimately die. But as I said, it's also come on the plant kingdom. We see that it's changed uh, the way that the plants behave in a sense, that they no longer yield up food naturally to man. But we see that that, that thorns and thistles and things like that have, uh, in a sense, corrupted that part of the creation so that it doesn't do what it had originally done. And it's not just limited to those two things either, but the animal kingdom has also been changed. And these, some of these things that we see on the screen here, like suffering and pain and disease and illness and aging and death, are part of the animal kingdom as well. And as I was thinking about that, I thought of this sort of picture. And in this picture, you can see this wolf pack chasing down a healthy bull moose. And we know how that's going to end eventually, is that basically the wolf pack catches up with the moose, and we see this brutal picture of the wolves basically literally eating the the bull moose alive. Not a pretty sight. Not a pretty sight at all. And you can think of the suffering and pain that this poor animal goes through as it's literally torn apart by these wolves. Not, Not a pleasant thing to have to think about, but that is a result of Adam's sin as well. That's come about as a result of uh, the corruption of the creation and uh, what Adam did. It plunged the whole creation 
into a state that's characterized by suffering and pain, disease and illness and death. Where will it end? Where will it end? Well, a marvelous thing that we see as we study the scriptures is what Adam started ends with Jesus Christ. And that's a key point that we'll look at this morning as we study Romans chapter 8. You'll know that as we went through Romans, as the book of Romans, we saw in the first three chapters that all of us, whether we're a Jew or a Gentile, that all of us are condemned by God's righteous law as sinners. And all of us are sinners because we're born into Adam's race and we sin naturally. But we saw as we went through this uh, study in the book of Romans to this point that the Lord Jesus Christ has delivered us from sin and all of its consequences. And that's what we're in the process of studying right now. We saw as we read through uh, chapters 3 to 5 that we're justified, that we are forgiven our sins, that we've been delivered from the penalty of our sins. And we also saw, and Brother Al alluded to this as we were singing this morning, that we're not only delivered from sin's penalty, but the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, has delivered us from sin's power as well. We're sanctified. We're set apart from our old ways. We've been brought out from under this old way of management that I'm run by my sinful nature, and I'm now under new management. I'm now a slave to righteousness. I've been freed from sin's power. I'm sanctified. And as we got into chapter 8, and over the last couple of weeks, we've seen, as we transition from chapter 7 into chapter 8, that we were once under law. We were under the condemnation of law. And we slaved away under God's righteous law, only to find out that we could never keep it, because we had this sinful nature. But that the Lord Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, has brought us out from underneath that law. He's delivered us from the, from the consequences of that law, that is, the condemnation that is naturally ours as a result of being sinners. He's brought us out from under that law and we're no longer ruled by it. We're now indwelled by the Spirit of God who leads us and rules over us from the inside out. And we've been looking at this in Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Last week, Brother Al, as he read uh, from, uh, and taught us from, from Romans 8, we looked at verses 14 to 17. And verses 14, verse 14 says that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And we saw that when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become children of God. We're, we're members of his family, and God's Spirit comes and indwells us. And not only are we members of God's family, but we're placed in God's family as an heir. We're a co-heir with Christ. And because we are an heir, that means that we have an inheritance And because we have an inheritance, it means that we look forward to something that we're going to receive. It says in verse 17 that if we are children of God, then we're also heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, since indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You see, heirs have an inheritance, and that inheritance is our glorification. That one day we're going to receive incorruptible bodies, These old bodies that we have now that are corrupted by sin and experience pain and suffering and illness and aging and death, one day we're going to be delivered from that corruption and we're going to receive new, incorruptible, immortal bodies. And that's all been made possible by what Jesus Christ did at Calvary's cross. We're justified. We're sanctified. And we will be glorified. We will receive that inheritance. One of the things to note is that when we were going through Romans 6, you notice that um, part of what we have received in our salvation is that we've been identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. If I'm going to experience the resurrection power of Christ in my life, then I must by faith allow my old man to take his place, that is, his place of crucifixion with Christ. And when by faith I reckon myself as dead unto sin and put away my old man, so to speak, that then when that old man is weakened to the point of crucifixion, that now the Spirit of Christ is liberated within me for me to experience the resurrection power of Christ. That that death, burial, and resurrection go hand in hand as far as our sanctification. It's interesting in this passage, what we're looking in Romans 8, and it's introduced in verse 17, 
that us being identified with Christ in his sufferings goes hand in hand with us being identified with him in his glorification. Do you see that? In verse 17, that if we are children, then we're also heirs and joint heirs with Christ, since indeed we are identified with his sufferings so that we may also be identified with him in glorification. I'm paraphrasing there. The two go together. And as a matter of fact, what we'll see today is that the one points to the other. The fact that we participate in the sufferings of Christ in our struggle against sin points us to the fact that we will also be glorified with him. Okay, let's read verses 18 to 25 of Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for these words that speak to us of hope, Father. We thank you for the uh, entirety and the completeness of the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that we're, we have the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that we've been able to learn more about that as we've been studying this book of Romans. We thank you that we're sanctified. As Brother Al has reminded us this morning that we're delivered from the power that sin once ruled over us. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity now to look forward to that which is future, that one day we're going to get new incorruptible bodies. Father, we look forward to that now, and as we look into your word, we just trust that you, your spirit, will teach us more about that. And this we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Keep your finger then in, in Romans chapter 8 and turn with me now to 1 John chapter 3. The scriptures teach us that we will be glorified, that we'll receive this deliverance from this body of corruption and mortality, subject to death that we live in now, that we will receive that deliverance at what is commonly referred to as the rapture. That is when the Lord Jesus Christ returns from his, for his church. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says that we'll be caught up together in clouds and we'll meet him in the air. And in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He is the first fruits over all creation, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that he is the first to have risen from the dead and to have received an immortal, incorruptible body. We are next in line. The church is next in line. That the day is going to come, and it could come at any time. It could happen before we walk out these doors at the back of this auditorium, that Christ could return with a shout, and that we would be caught up in the air, and we would be changed, 1 Corinthians 15 says, in a twinkling of an eye. And that which is corruptible, this old... Death-racked body, sin-racked body, would be changed into something that's incorruptible. And this old mortal body, this body that's subject to aging and death and disease and sickness, will be changed into a mortal body. And it'll happen in a twinkling of an eye, and it could happen at any time. We're next in line. And we're going to see as we look at this passage that the whole creation awaits that moment. Because when that happens, it's going to set off a chain of events that's going to set all of creation free. We'll turn then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I just spoke of these verses in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and verses 51 to 54. <clears throat> If you're running out of fingers, grab one of your neighbor's fingers and stick their finger in Romans 8. 
because we're going to get back there to Romans chapter 8. <laughs> it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51, Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And that's the term that the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit uses for speaking of Christians, that is, members of Christ's church, the true church, that have experienced the death of their bodies. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this, in, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. The time is going to come when we will have bodies as members of Christ's church and glorified in His presence, that we will no longer be subject to that long list of nasty things that came into the creation as a result of Adam's sin. Because Christ conquered it at Calvary's cross. He conquered sin at Calvary's cross and He has conquered all of its consequences and its effects. And we are going to benefit from that victory. Now, <clears throat> turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 4 as this body is being like a jar of clay. It's something that's, that's very fragile. And in verse 8, he says that we are hard-pressed on every side and yet not crushed. And we are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Even the Apostle Paul said, life is a struggle. And it just doesn't seem fair sometimes, but... The Lord Jesus Christ is going to deliver us from that struggle. He has delivered us from God's perspective. And we'll see this as we continue in Romans chapter 8, that from God's point of view, we are glorified. That it's ours. It's as good as done. And we will realize it in His time. We will experience it in His time. You go over then to verse 14 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that knowing that He who raised up the Lord Jesus, that is God the Father, who raised up the Lord Jesus, will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Skip to verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Now look at the way that Paul talks about the comparison here between us being identified with Christ in His sufferings and us also being identified with Him in glorification. He says, For our light suffering, our light affliction, which is temporary, it's but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Right? While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 8 as well. It says in verse 18 of Romans 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That the, the struggle that we're going through now pales in comparison to the glory that shall be revealed in us. If you were to take the two, our sufferings and the glory, and put them in one of those weigh scales, it would just be clank. It's just not to be compared. That what we go through, and, and I don't want to trivialize the struggles that, that, that we experience in this world, and I also acknowledge that some experience greater struggles than others, but the Word of God says that by comparison, that's a light affliction, and that it's outweighed by a long shot by the glory which shall be revealed in us. <clears throat> You see, when Adam sinned, the creation was subjected to frustration and corruption. And I came across this interesting picture, I think, that, that just it speaks in many ways for what the creation is experiencing right now. We see this picture of this tree that has a couple of knots in it, and the sap has run out of it almost like tears, and then there's this little mark underneath here that looks like a frown. That's the picture that Paul is painting in Romans chapter 8. The creation is groaning right now. 
It's groaning right now as a result of Adam's sin, right? It says in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to, I believe it says frustration in the NIV. Anybody got an NIV? Frustration in your Bible, right? In my King James, it uses the word futility. You ever think life is futile? You try and you try and you try to get ahead, but it just doesn't seem to happen sometimes. Welcome to part of the creation that Adam's sin corrupted. We're part of that, right? The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. No one in their right mind would say, yeah, I want this to happen. But because of him who subjected it in hope, it was God that subjected the creation to that frustration, but in hope of something that would come better. That the Lord Jesus Christ would come into this world and he would not only purchase for us the forgiveness of our sins, but that he would deliver us and the whole creation from the bondage of corruption. He would deliver us and the whole creation from the mess that Adam started so long ago. We see in verse 21, it says, because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And you see, the whole creation is waiting for the next event. And the next event is the rapture, when we will be caught up with him and we will be chained, changed. And when that happens, it's going to set off a chain of events that will deliver the whole creation from the bondage of corruption that it's in right now. In verse 22, there's an interesting picture that's given here. The creation is likened to a woman that is expecting a child, right? Look at what it says. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now, right? The creation of which we are part of is like a woman that's in labor, suffering now and experiencing pain, but anticipating delivery from that struggle and the revelation of something new and wonderful, right? I count myself to have been blessed that I was able to be there when my wife gave birth to both of our children. It's something that I'll never experience, giving birth to a child, so I can't speak authoritatively about it. But I do know this, and I think that that any any of the ladies that are here that are mothers would agree that the, the pain that they experienced during childbirth is far outweighed by the marvelous prize that was delivered into their arms after that pain. Isn't there a beautiful picture that God is painting for us here? We are part of a creation that is like that. We are going through birth pains right now. As a matter of fact, this creation has been going through that for thousands of years. But the time is going to come when the creation is going to be delivered from that and something beautiful and wonderful is going to be brought forth. And the first part of that delivery that we look forward to is going to be the glorification of the church. You see, when the church is glorified, the whole creation will also be liberated from the consequences of sin. That's what it says in this passage. The creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 11. Brother Al mentioned that after the rapture, after we have been changed and we receive our glorified bodies, that a period is going to come where Christ will reign on this earth for a thousand years. And it's going to be a very different world then. A very different world. And it's described in part in Isaiah chapter 11. Look at what it says in verse 6. During that time, after we have been glorified, after the church has its Christ-like bodies, this is, this is the way the animal kingdom is going to be in verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw with the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand into the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea." 
And I'm confident that the wolves are going to play with the moose as well. It's going to be a very, very different world. And the whole creation is waiting now, laboring in birth pangs for us, the sons of God. That's what it says in verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, the heirs of God, those who are co-heirs with Christ. That's us. What a marvelous thing is going to be initiated when we receive our glorious bodies, that it's going to set off this process of delivering the whole creation from the bondage of corruption that it was brought into as a result of Adam's sin. <clears throat> and Revelation chapter 21 talks about the period that will come after the thousand year reign. You know that after Christ reigns on this earth for a thousand years, at the end of that time it says in, in, in Revelation that there'll be a great white throne judgment. And that death and Hades will be resurrected. And those who have sadly not put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will be cast into the lake of fire. Death is the last enemy, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, that will be defeated. And then it says at the beginning of Revelation 21, and this passage comes right after that, that I saw, this is John speaking, and God gave him a glimpse of this. He gave him a glimpse of this liberation that's going to happen where there'll be a new creation. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And if you continue reading in Revelation chapter 21, it says in verse 4, for there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. There's going to be a new creation that the whole creation is going to be delivered from this bondage of corruption. But it's waiting. It's waiting and laboring in pain, and we're part of that for this next great event, for the glorification of church saints when we will receive our bodies. And that was all made possible. And even this, the revelation of a new creation and the delivery of the existing creation from its bondage has all been made possible by what Jesus Christ did at the cross 2,000 years ago. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Isn't it a marvelous thing that, that he has forgiven my sins through what he did at, at Calvary's cross? He's delivered me from sin's power, and he's going to completely deliver me in this body that I have from sin's corruption and all of its effects, and not only me, but the whole creation, the animals, the plants, everything. One day we will live in a place where there is no more sorrow, there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no illness, there's no sickness, there's no, no death. We're completely delivered from the presence of sin. That's been made possible because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. And it says in Romans chapter 8 <clears throat> that we, in verse 23, have the first fruits of the Spirit. At this point in time, we have experienced the initial working of the Spirit of God. God has a purpose for us, and we're going to study this. Uh, we'll look at this next week. He is conforming us to the likeness of His Son. He's going to change us into Christ's likeness. And when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit came and lived in us, that we received the first fruits of that transformation. But we hope for this, that the work is going to be finished. What is it that it says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6? You want to look it up? Take the time to look it up. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. How's our time? we got a few minutes still. <clears throat> Paul is thanking God for the Philippian believers and the joy that he's, he's experienced and the fellowship that he's had with them. And then he says in verse 6 that I'm confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Can I paraphrase? He's saying that the Holy Spirit who has begun the work of transforming you into the likeness of Jesus Christ will complete it on the day that Jesus Christ comes back for you, on his day. That's what we refer to as the rapture. We have that hope. We have that confidence, that blessed assurance, 
because of what God's Word tells us. It says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit, and we ourselves, as part of this creation, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Brother L talked about adoption last week in verse 15. It means to be placed in God's family as an heir and a son. And God has already done that because he's positioned us in Christ. We were there as part of Adam's race. He was our representative as the cross and we were crucified with him. We were raised up together with him in newness of life. And I'm positioned in God's family as an heir and a co-heir. But the time is going to come when I'm revealed, when, when me and my inheritance is revealed to the whole creation and I eagerly wait for that for the consequences of that placement in God's family as an heir to be revealed and for me to experience it in time. In verse 24, it says that we were saved in this hope. Right? You see, being saved and having my sins forgiven is more than just hoping to go to heaven. It's about becoming like Christ. We have the first fruits of the Spirit, And we have the Spirit as a seal that guarantees that this is going to happen. We don't have the time to look up in Ephesians chapter 1, but there it's spoken of that the Spirit is a seal guaranteeing the redemption of our bodies. We have this adoption. We're positioned as heirs, and we will be revealed in the future as such. This is the culmination or the hope of our salvation. We are completely saved from sin and its effects, justified sanctified and glorified. God's salvation is complete and entire. You see, this hope that we have, it says in in these last two verses, and we read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, isn't based on things that are seen, right? You can't see any of this. I've tried to give you some pictures today, but they're just emblems and things that point you to the truth that's in God's Word. Our hope Our blessed assurance is based on the sure word of God. God's word tells us this is going to happen. And as a result, it says in verse 25, that if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. I think what we need to do as we struggle through life is we need to see ourselves as that woman. That as we go through life struggles, that we are going through labor pains. And just as a woman perseveres through those pains because she knows at the end of it all there's something really wonderful and beautiful that outweighs the pain and the suffering that precedes it and it's worth waiting for and struggling through. I believe that God did that because it's a picture of what we go through now as part of the creation. And that it's intended to encourage us to persevere through life's struggles because we know that the time is going to come that when those birth pangs, so to speak, are going to come to an end and we're going to be delivered from this corrupted creation into a glorious new state. We need to fix our eyes on that. We can't see it, but the Word of God says that it's going to happen. Can we close with a hymn? Number 394 in the, uh, in the red hymn book.